good. <clears throat> All right. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, hereditary cardiac disease in aviators. I'm a cardiologist in uh, Utrecht, the Netherlands, the Central Military Hospital, also in the University Hospital, and I have a small private practice in Rotterdam. Uh, it is <coughs> to say that uh, this um, um, presentation has been made also in collaboration with Professor Wild from uh, Amsterdam. Uh, why do I mention him? Because I think he's one of the, the best informed uh, people uh, on the, in the field of uh, hereditary cardiac diseases. The problem is, <coughs> what should you recommend to an asymptomatic, asymptomatic patient with hereditary cardiac disease with respect to flying? And uh, because he doesn't know that he is a patient, <coughs> because he has no complaints. But you find out. Now we have a, quite a bunch of them uh, uh, on the moment. We have uh, hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy, we have uh, Brugada syndrome, and we have uh, many other ones. Uh, the congenital long QT syndrome, the arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia or cardiomyopathy. Uh, the dilated uh, non-compaction uh, cardiomyopathy. We have the uh, 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 catechol, I mean, um, uh, VT, uh, short QT, you name it, and we have it. I'm going to uh, concentrate now on two of the uh, most intriguing, I think, um, the hypertrophic uh, cardiom cardiomyopathy and the Brugada syndrome. So what is, what is it where, where you are afraid of um, in, um, in this kind of uh, diseases? Uh, the problem is that there is a risk of sudden incapacitation because of potentially lethal arrhythmias. And when you follow this line, you see here a sinus rhythm, there is some extra beat, and there it goes wrong. You see ventricular fibrillation, <coughs> maybe torsade point like and it goes on and on and boom <coughs> here is the uh, ICD the uh, implantable cardioverter defibrillator who ends the arrhythmia and the patient is going back to normal rhythm so that's a very nice invention for these people and how, how does uh, such an internal cardioverter defibrillator look like well this is the x-ray uh, um, you see here uh, the, the battery and all the electronics and you have leads that go in, in fact to the right ventricle, uh, right ventricular apex and uh, there is uh, rhythm detection and when the rhythm is going too fast um, there is a shock delivered what uh, in fact uh, restores the normal rhythm. Uh, <coughs> some smart people in the audience say well doesn't it look uh, a lot like a pacemaker? And uh, you're right, because uh, you have the, the same uh, electronic uh, system, the batteries, and you have the lead. Uh, well, just uh, a point, um, a pacemaker is there when the heart goes too slow, and a uh, defibrillator is there when the heart goes too fast. So that's uh, <coughs> a, a take-home message. And you, you now you have seen uh, the potential risk of um, hereditary cardiac disease. I want you to um, um, uh, answer a few a question, and is should an aviator with a hereditary cardiac disease be allowed to fly? And maybe uh, I have some technical uh, assistance here uh, as to uh, put um, the question into the audience. It is a rather silent bell. Then think about it. Uh, you have a choice of four. The, f the first choice is uh, you should never allow uh, someone like that to fly. Uh, the second uh, choice could be uh, only when you have an ICD. And uh, the third is only when there are no complaints. Uh, in the cardiology, we call that silent arrhythmias. And the fourth one is only when a proper risk assessment has been made. Are we getting the, the question or uh, we hold on? Uh, 
Okay, I think <coughs> you are now ready to vote. You say never, he should never fly again. He should only fly with a defibrillator. He should only fly when he has no complaints, but there might be some arrhythmias. And he said, well, maybe he can fly, but we have to look at him. All right, I'm curious what comes out of it. Okay. You say, well, <coughs> we are going to see what, uh, what the answer will be. It's mostly about never and maybe. <coughs> it's now or never. We, <coughs> in um, aviation cardiology, well, in aviation in general, of course, we talk about the accept uh, acceptable risk. And it has been here on the floor um, a few times already. Um, the risk of incapacitation should be less than 1% per year, and the famous 1% rule. Um, it is set up, in fact, for um, uh, civil aviation, but in military aviation we have to um, uh, look at um, maybe uh, an even um, higher level of um, uh, uh, or lower levels, so to say, of incapacitation, yeah, because you have a lot of stress and with the risk of acute lead intoxication, you have uh, fatigue, sleep deprivation, G-forces, uh, vibrations of the plane, uh, sound, it's a lot of noise there and there, so it should be maybe even a little less than that. And let me introduce you first <coughs> Mr. H.C. He is a male, 40 years old, he has no complaints, and he feels perfect. Um, you see him for a regular checkup, and now find an abnormal EKG. Um, was that there in the previous years, that was uh, more or less, and we have made uh, an echo, but was not very uh, clear what it was. Uh, no, no big abnormalities, at least. His medical history and his physical uh, uh, examination are normal. He has a family history that tells that three uncles, being the brothers of his mother, died suddenly at about age 70. And his father died at age 52. So uh, sh should we consider it as a positive uh, family history? I think uh, we should because of the father not because of the uncles. I don't care about uncles, I, got, I care about the father. Um, and especially because uh, the father is uh, 52. And, um, but what kind of risk do we assess with that? We uh, assess the risk of coronary artery disease. So that helps. His occupation is a pilot uh, on a commercial airline. He uh, sports, uh, he's do, doing two, three times a week uh, running. He had done uh, two and a half uh, marathons a year, and he loves scuba diving. So he is really in good shape. And then we see his EKG. And to help you a little bit, leads one, two, three, AVR, AV, AVL, AVF, and V1, two, V6. And there are a few things. <coughs> First, of course, all of you have seen that it is a sinus rhythm. Um, the second one, uh, what you see is that that are huge QRS complexes. And third, what you uh, must have noticed is that there is a negative T wave in lead one, AVL, and uh, V2 to t V6. Um, well, you, sometimes you can doubt about if an EKG is a little bit um, um, abnormal, but I can assure you this is very abnormal. And maybe even, okay, well, that's it. <coughs> to talk a little bit about hypertrophic cardio cardiomyopathy, or when there is an obstruction, uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomy cardiomyopathy, this is an end stage of, uh, of this disease. You see that the septum here is very much uh, increased in size. You should imagine that the normal size of a septum is about one centimeter, and uh, here uh, I think it's uh, about four. 
Um, so it's very big and you see a lot of black dots in there and in fact those black dots are uh, infarction sites and how does it come because uh, the the blood flow the arteries that provide the heart itself uh, of blood cannot cope with such a thickness and you get um, uh, often asymptomatic but definitive small infarctions in the center of the um, um, hypertrophic uh, septum. Here you see another um, uh, image of this. this. This is the septum, here's the right ventricle, here's the left ventricle. Um, the normal uh, size of the left ventricle wall is about uh, 10 or 12 millimeters. And when you look uh, at the microscope, uh, you, you see that everything is in disarray. Uh, uh, when I was a little bit younger, I thought, well, you know, the heart is thick, so that's good. Uh, you, can, you have a lot of muscle there. But the problem is that the muscle is there, but it does not work together. It's like, it's like an orchestra, um, and everyone is playing his own part uh, in his own time. So the composition, the music is kind of chaotic, and effectively, it does not work well. And this is schematically how it looks like. You see a very thick septum. Often uh, the rest of the, uh, the left ventricle is uh, um, also uh, in the, uh, involved in the process, or in even parts of the right ventricle. And uh, here you see the aorta. Here you see the left uh, atrium. Here you see the aortic valve. And here you see the mitral valve. What happens now is when the left ventricle is going to contract, um, you see that it kind of closes off uh, the, uh, the outlet and you have an increase in, um, in blood uh, 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 speed but a decrease in the amount of blood that can go out. And um, normally to this process is also that it kind of causes a mitral regurgitation. So the blood is not going into the aorta, but it's going also to the, uh, to the uh, left atrium. And here you see echo pictures of it. Uh, in the diastole, you say, well, there is room enough uh, for the blood to go from the left ventricle to the aorta. But here in the systole, you see that the aorta, the, the outlet of the left ventricle is almost closed off. Here you see MRI images, and you, without going into detail, uh, this is the left atrium, right atrium, left ventricle, right ventricle. You see at least that is uh, this is much too thick, and and other pictures show that there you can also have like those fibrous patches that see uh, that you can 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 also uh, visualize with uh, MRI, the scar tissue. In the Netherlands, we have a special uh, uh, history uh, on these um, hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy. It is uh, autosomal dominant and um, usually a mutation in the MIBPC3 gene <coughs> in 40% of the Dutch uh, population with um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And what came, became evident after some time is that it's uh, mainly um, uh, in, in uh, very selected populations, and that population is a follower of uh, Menno Simons. And Menno Simons uh, was an Anab Anabaptist in the uh, 16th century. And um, ap apparently, that was a group of people that, uh, um, that carry that uh, gene. And, um, you can also find it back in um, uh, they call it the, the Mennonists uh, in populations in the United States and Canada. Uh, Canada, you can trace all those people back to that group uh, from the north of the Netherlands, from Friesland, that were followers of uh, Menno Simons. You have a few well-known malignant variants, <coughs> like a mutation in the MHI7 beta heavy chain um, and uh, the troponin. Uh, but there are many um, genetic mutations and uh, <coughs> there is a big discussion about which genotype fits which phenotype. Um, 
with people that have an hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy, about 70% you can find um, um, genetic, uh, genetic typing. Uh, that means 30% we are still in the dark about it. Well, this is back to your early days uh, as a doctor uh, when you were at school. Here you have the myosin, the contracted, uh, the, uh, the contracted element uh, with myosin and actin. And you see the, the heads, the myosin light chains and the beta myosin heavy chains were uh, part of the um, uh, uh, changes uh, lay. Also the troponin, when you remember, hey, this is troponin, that's what I also uh, use when uh, I want to know if someone has a myocardial infarction. That comes from here, from the actin. So we, uh, the guy was uh, not amused uh, to hear that um, we wanted to look uh, at him a little bit further. Um, we did an uh, exercise test. He uh, did uh, 240 watts, watts um, without a problem. Um, a maximum heart rate of 176 um, uh, a minute. No arrhythmias, no ischemia. Well, ischemia is hard to tell with such a kind of uh, EKG. On echocardiography, we saw an apical uh, cardiomyopathy and there was no obstruction at uh, the left uh, ventricular outflow tract. We did a halter EKG, there were no arrhythmias. We did a CT scan of the coronary arteries, and they were normal. We did an MRI and the max maximum diameter of the wall was about 15 millimeters. But we saw some patchy delayed enhancement, uh, maybe indicating some fibrosis. And then uh, we sent him to the, uh, uh, for, for genetic counseling, and they said, well, there's no alteration in the MYBP3 gen, the gene, um, that's uh, what, is, uh, what I talked about. Uh, but there was an alteration of the MYH7 gene of uncertain variety, uh, you know. Uh, if, they, if they are uncertain, uh, I'm even more uncertain what it means. <coughs> so what, what does it mean? So let's look at some risks of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, the main risk, of course, is sudden cardiac death. <coughs> and uh, in selected populations, it counts to 2 to 4% per year. I say, well, it's an easy question. Uh, he should uh, not fly at least. <coughs> the problem is that these data come from clinics that concentrate only on um, genetic um, uh, diseases. So there you see the, the, the worst of the worst, and then you have this kind of um, uh, death rate. When you are looking in the population as a whole, you see an, um, uh, a risk of certain cardiac deaths of 0.5 till 1% per year. Uh, it comes also with other problems um, because the heart is being so thick, uh, the diastolic function diminishes, the heart cannot fill anymore well, and you can get heart failure uh, in 5 till 10% of the, uh, of, of the uh, people with this disease. And uh, because uh, uh, the blood cannot flow easily from the left atrium to the left uh, ventricle, you have a chance of 20% of atrial fibrillation. So <coughs> what are the established risk factors for these, um, uh, uh, for a certain kind of death? And then we talk about a risk of 4 till 6% per year, even. Well, the most obvious is um, people that had a previous cardiac arrest or spontaneous sustained VT. Um, those are the bad guys. <coughs> and then people with a big uh, septum of th more than 30 mil millimeters. Then <coughs> uh, there is um, uh, uh, functional um, measurement. You put them on the uh, bicycle and you measure the blood pressure and um, when the blood pressure, the systolic uh, blood pressure does not rise uh, more than 25 millimeters, or even when it falls um, more than 15 millimeters, um, it uh, is a bad sign. But it is only 
applicable for patients under 40 years. Then non-sustained <coughs> uh, ventricular tachycardia on halter monitoring, that's a bad sign. Um, a history of at least one sudden cardiac death in a relative under 45 years, together with a history of syncope of the patient himself. <coughs> Um, well, that, um, in this case, it was not the case because his father died at 52, probably more uh, um, because of uh, atherosclerotic uh, heart disease, and the guy had no complaints. And a resting peak instantaneous left ventricle outflow tract gradient of more than 30 millimeters mercury. So when we go through all this, the guy has no risk factors. <coughs> Then you have the potential risk factors. There is, um, they're, they're trying to establish how can we predict what's going on. Um, and one uh, that is maybe coming is the delayed enhancement on MRI, uh, like those, uh, those spots of fibrosis. <coughs> Early onset, when uh, people, uh, uh, when you discover the, the, uh, the disease when they're young, they have a higher risk of uh, having uh, problems later myocardial ischemia and atrial fibrillation. What is absolutely not proven is EP testing, uh, heart rate variability, QT dispersion, genetic testing uh, doesn't give us a clue because there is no clear relation between genotype and phenotype and genotype and risk on uh, certain uh, cardiac death. They say, well, <coughs> I've heard that um, people with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, usually die uh, when they are um, exercising. Well, <coughs> there has been some investigation that not, not very much, um, but uh, there has been an uh, article uh, about exercise-induced ventricular arrhythmias and risk of sudden cardiac death in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And um, that was a cardi cardiomyopathy clinic and they investigated 1,380 patients, and they uh, did an exercise test till they were tired. And of those 1,380 patients, three patients got VF, no patients got, got a sustained VT, and four, 24 patients got a uh, non-sustained VT. And they say it was associated with more severe hypertrophy, so the, 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 the thicker uh, septums. And here you see the follow-up uh, in uh, survival free um, from any problem from arrhythmias. And it ends up that, um, in fact, uh, when you have no inducible uh, VF or uh, sustained VT uh, or non-sustained VT uh, on exercise, your prognosis is quite good. <coughs> uh, however, when you have uh, VF or um, non-sustained VT, uh, the prognosis is much worse. So you can use it in the uh, classification of risk. So what, what kind of risk um, uh, does this uh, gentleman carry? Uh, and how should we approach it? Uh, we have to look for risk factors for uh, sudden cardiac death. <coughs> and when there is no risk, risk factor at all, the risk of incapacitation, uh, you can say it's less than 1% per year. Uh, there should be uh, a normal symptom uh, limited exercise test and uh, no restriction as to occupation, uh, including flying or sports. When you have one uh, risk factor, uh, what to do, that's a problem. When you have two or more uh, risk factors, you should not exercise uh, maximum and maybe there's an indication for an ICD. So, <coughs> in fact, we are here, no risk factors, you should reassure them and follow them up, of course. Um, well, documented previous cardiac arrest, here they are very modest to say, consider uh, uh, ICD, well, I said, I would say, put an ICD. Um, in one risk, is, uh, risk factor is kind of indeterminate, and two or more is uh, ICD um, and amiodarone, I think that's uh, not any longer in the question, uh, right? So what do the regulations uh, tell about this? 
Uh, well, the DRFCL is still uh, 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 applicable in Holland till uh, I thought uh, April 8th. And then we're going to move on to the next level. And it says <coughs> applicants with any abnormality of the pericardium, myocardium, or endocardium not covered above. When they, they mentioned another, a few other uh, um, diseases shall be un assessed as unfit. And it might uh, be considered by the AMS as fit uh, following complete resolution. Well, that will not, never re uh, resolute, of course, resolve. And a satisfactory cardiology evaluation. And in compliance with this and that. And what should you do? All these kind of uh, investigations. <laughs> Echo, exercise testing, scintigraphy, uh, uh, halter and uh, coronary angiography. And then <coughs> they say, class 1 OML or class 2 OSL may be required. So they leave it in the middle a little bit, but at least not totally unrestricted. Then um, the EASA um, statement said, in fact, the same, but um, they said say something else. Uh, applicants with other cardiac disorders may be assessed as fit, subject to satisfactory cardiology, uh, cardiological assessment. And it says also with symptomatic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy should be assessed as unfit, uh, which is absolutely true, of course. And it uh, stays with that. <coughs> um, the document of the JAA uh, uh, from 2009 uh, mentions a few of the risk factors I went uh, through with you. A fit assessment may be considered in ad adulthood, no family history of SCD, hypertrophy of the septum uh, should be less than two and a half centimeter, uh, vasomotor uh, instability on exercise, that's you know the, the increase in blood pressure, occult or overt ventricular tachyarrhythmia has non-sustained VTs or VTs and no complaints. When, when, when he has not that, then you say he can fly with a class one or my limitation. Then the ICAO <coughs> uh, mentions this and said you should be able to have to finish uh, three stages of Bruce protocol, no VT, no family history, uh, uh, septum of less than two and a half centimeter and an OML restriction and they mention separately AF is disqualifying and I can and I think that is uh, that's a good thing to to do because when you get AF with this disease it means that it is advanced and let me try to get rid of this one what about the military <coughs> um, well, they s have the same statement about myocardial disease, but apart, they say cardiomyopathy is disqualifying. And um, uh, even uh, in the waiver guide, it says it is disqualifying for all classes of flying duties. And ACM is not waiverable. So in the light of what you see now uh, and what you know now, um, uh, you, you might say, is it, is it still defendable or should we a little, uh, be a little bit more lenient about this? It comes um, to that uh, when, uh, because well, this was a civil uh, uh, pilot, uh, he, was, he will be able to fly with an OML, OML restriction. Uh, uh, would he have been a military? He uh, was, uh, would not have been able to fly anymore. But the question is, is that always right? And exactly these kind of questions, I'm really delighted that we are here as a group of cardiologists to discuss these kind of questions because um, we should judge our uh, pilots with, uh, with some evidence. We move on to the Brigada. <coughs> uh, it's a uh, genetic uh, disease uh, of uh, this gene, SCN5A. However, it's only found in the maximum of 30% of cases. <coughs> and it's um, inherited autosomal uh, dominant. It's uh, endemic in East and Southeast Asia, Japan and Thailand. It's even more uh, uh, and then, uh, endemic. You have seen the, the figures before. It was uh, 146 uh, out of 100,000. And in the West, it's all about 20 out of uh, 100,000. Sudden cardiac death occurs typically at rest 
uh, because of polymorphic uh, VT, the mechanism is the, mechani the mechanism is uh, a date not totally resolved. We know it has to do with uh, um, uh, sodium channels and uh, the right ventricular outflow tract arrhythmogenic area, but um, uh, how, how it works exactly is not yet established. <coughs> um, you have. Uh, it's important to say that you have a Brugada EKG with no symptoms, and you have the Brugada syndrome with symptoms. We had uh, seen that previously, like uh, with the WPW and uh, um, uh, long QT uh, 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 syndrome. It is uh, very um, endemic in, um, uh, in, in Thailand and Laos. And um, there, <coughs> the disease is known as Bangun Gut, uh, in my best Thai. Uh, and that means um, uh, it comes from a bad spirit, who they call Da Cho. Um, it is not something you can ask for uh, in your Chinese restaurant, uh, but uh, it means uh, bad spirit. And it has the form of a jealous woman, they say. And here there's an older picture <coughs> that uh, uh, sees he's a spirit and he's saying, well, let me uh, w uh, go and uh, take here. You see the, the spirit of the man of, uh, coming out of his mouth. And um, uh, this is a more uh, um, uh, recent uh, image of how they envision that uh, spirit. And if you say, well, this uh, looks familiar to me, I, I have one at home uh, uh, for 25 years, uh, that's purely coincidental. <laughs> it, and their uh, belief is uh, to a level that, they, um, that there, there is um, a tribe in which the men um, uh, tend to dress uh, at night as women, because then they hope they can uh, deceive the, the, the bad spirit, uh, because they have noticed it comes mainly at the man. This is uh, the typical uh, Brugada uh, type 1 uh, EKG, uh, they call it uh, coved dome, V1, V2. And this, what they call saddleback, <coughs> um, I'm me not being uh, a horse rider, I thought uh, which. Uh, uh, how, how should you sit on it? Uh, but it's type 2 and type 3 uh, is the table, uh, saddleback type, and it is the called dome. <coughs> and, and then I want to introduce you to a fighter pilot with um, a Brigada EKG. Well, does he have it? Uh, it's a guy of 27 years old. He is a F 16 pilot, and he served several years already without any problem. Uh, no complaints, physical um, examination, no abnormalities. Even he had a normal GG. But hurrah, hurrah, he had a mother. And um, his mother is uh, 55 years of, of age. Uh, she is in good health, but she had some palpitations. So uh, she was sent to the cardiologist. He made an EKG, and he found a Brugada EKG with the mother. She never had life-threatening arrhythmias, but they thought it was wise to put in, because of the EKG and prophylactic and ICD that had not fired anyway till now. But she was genetically positive. They, she, she had uh, the gene. And uh, while that was all uh, developing, <coughs> some uh, thought, uh, well, and how do you have uh, a family, you know? And yes, I have a son, he's in the army. And uh, then um, the doctor got um, uh, alerted and said, well, <coughs> wouldn't it be wise to test your son too? And then we got, he got into some problem. He had no spontaneous Brugada 1 EKG. There was, <coughs> um, the, sometimes when, when you have not an EKG, but you say you, you, might, you might have the Brugada syndrome, you, can, you may provoke it by giving ajmaline or um, flickenite or whatever, and then the uh, EKG can emerge. There were, on exercise there's no arrhythmias, but in the recovery phase there was a Brigada 1 EKG. He went through the centrifuge test to 9G without any problem, but also in the recovery he had a Brigada 1 EKG. 
and he was tested and he also had the, the gene. So, <coughs> uh, what are we doing? The guy has no complaints. Um, he, uh, uh, no, but now he feels a, a little bit sick because of the doctor. <coughs> and um, th there has been a, a lot of literature uh, about um, how can you now uh, ass assess the risk in uh, uh, people with the Brigada EGG who are asymptomatic. And I think one of the most important is the finger study that came out in 2010. Um, and uh, Professor Wilder was one of the uh, authors of this, uh, uh, of this uh, publication. And <coughs> to go to the conclusions of that finger uh, study is that type 2 and type 3 Brigada EKG carry no increased risk of uh, certain cardiac death. An Ajmalin induced type 1 Brigada EKG carries no increased risk on certain cardiac death. What might <coughs> carry an um, increased re risk of sudden cardiac death is a spontaneous type 1 Brigada EKG. When you have this EKG, you have an incident rate of uh, sudden cardiac death of a half percent per year. Do you have this EKG, a type 1 Brigada, with aborted cardiac arrest? Uh, then the, uh, the death rate is 7.7 percent .7 per year. When you have syncope, uh, you have 1.9 uh, percent per year. Happily, uh, it, it is that uh, before you move to the uh, stage of aborted cardiac arrest, the majority, 80, 90 percent of the people have complaints of dizziness or palpitations or whatsoever. <coughs> Negative results are important too. Uh, there was no increased risk attached to gender to the, uh, the presence or the absence of the gene, to a family history of uh, certain cardiac deaths, to age, or to a positive or negative electrophysiology study. Um, I have to say that this statement is uh, right, except in um, Belgium and in Spain, because uh, in Belgium uh, there is Pedro Brigada, and in Spain uh, is his brother, and uh, it's, uh, they, they still insist that uh, electrophysiology, uh, electrophysiology studies uh, carry some uh, prognostic value. But the rest of the world has, in fact, stepped out of this um, uh, concept. And uh, the finger study uh, does not support uh, any uh, value uh, for uh, electrophysiology study. So there we have this pilot. No complaints. No spontaneous type 1. Brigade EKG, uh, but he has one after uh, Ajmalin exercise or centrifuges. No arrhythmias. He has the gene. He has no positive family history. So, <coughs> can he can he continue his flying duties as a fighter pilot, or what would you recommend? And we have to think, <coughs> uh, as um, compared to the civilian uh, population of pilots, of course, that. Um, in the Brugada uh, syndrome, uh, ventriculous arrhythmias can be provoked by elevated body temperature, so like fever or fire or whatever. And people with Brugada should avoid certain drugs, uh, including some painkillers <coughs> and anti-malaria medication and things like that, antiarrhythmics. So what, what do the guidelines tell about it? <coughs> um, it uh, is uh, quite easy because um, uh, the RFCL3, GAA, and EASA, it's not mentioned. In the ICAO, it says uh, it mentions the Brugada syndrome. And they say <coughs> it should be asymptomatic, no family history of SCD, have minimal ECG features or features seen only intermittently or following pharmacological provocation. Uh, this is a little bit vague, but I think um, um, they, they, they want to say that uh, you, you might only have a type 1 EKG after provocation. I have no evidence of complex ventricular rhythm disturbances or irregular halter monitoring. And they say uh, you should be restricted to multi-crew operations. It is not um, 
mentioned in the uh, MAR FCL3 or, the US, uh, or in the waiver guide. Um, there is an, uh, in 2010, there was uh, uh, an article about two uh, Swiss uh, aviators and um, what uh, of, of <coughs> they said the first one had a spontaneous Brugada 1 EKG and the second one had a Brugada 2 uh, type EKG and uh, with a positive Eismolin test. It turned out that um, they felt that the, the spontaneous Brugada 1 EKG uh, would carry a risk of more than 1% per year and they uh, declared them unfit, you can question that. And uh, patient 2, um, they were still in the process of uh, uh, seeing if he had uh, restrictions, but he withdrew before the end of the procedure. This is how our British colleagues um, uh, uh, handle this uh, problem. We have a Brugada pattern on the EKG and type 1 here. It said uh, type 1 uh, with symptoms or history of documented VF or VT, well, syncope, um, or uh, tachyarrhythmias, of course, <coughs> I think you, you should be unfit. Um, nocturnal agonal respiration. Uh, well, ask, uh, ask many wives how their husband, uh, um, how the respiration of her husband is at night, and you get, well, he snores and sometimes he uh, doesn't, um, he doesn't uh, breathe at all. Um, I think it's a little bit much to put this one uh, here as a risk factor. Then we go type 1, <coughs> persistent or intermittent and asymptomatic. And they say class 1, OML, class 2, unrestricted. Type 2, persistent or intermittent and asymptomatic. Class 1, OML, class 2, uh, unrestricted. Uh, we would say maybe everything can be class 1, unrestricted and type 3 is in fact um, class 1 and 2 unrestricted. So they, they try to differentiate a little bit based on uh, the risk factors that we have. So in conclusion, <coughs> uh, asymptomatic patients with hereditary cardiac disease should be assessed indivi individually for flying duties. Application of the one person rule gives some direction to the risk assessment and uh, also, other factors should be taken into account, uh, like environment, environmental influence, like heat, noise, sleep deprivation, especially in military aviators. So, to come back to, uh, to the question, should an aviator with an hereditary cardiac disease be allowed to fly? Well, then I um, ask you to put on the question again. The question is never, only with an ICD, only when there are no complaints and silent arrhythmias or only after a proper risk assessment has been made. And we are still counting. Okay, thank you very much. And I thank you for your attention.